But it's wonderful to be here. And you guys should be just, just blown away that you are a part of something awesome. Amen. That you are a part of something that's alive. This church is alive. Amen. Can you think of all those people that are in boring churches? I don't mean that in a critical way, but there are some people in boring places, dying places, but you're in something that's living. And what's amazing is that your, your, your name is Living Hope. Thank God that you're not dying. It would be like an oxymoron. It would be like what Revelation says. You have a name that you're alive, but really you're dead. So thank God that you're alive. Touch your neighbor and say, you're alive. <laughs> And now tell that neighbor, let's keep it alive. Let's keep it alive. Wouldn't it be terrible if you were dying and you were still called Living Hope? It would be terrible if we were called a radical church and we weren't radical, you know. Um, but we, we really thank God for what he's been doing over the last um, few days. Uh, what he's done today and what we've heard today about what the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit and us just being more intentional and deeper relationship with him. Amen. I'd like you to turn your Bibles to the book of Habakkuk. I was saying to Jonathan um, and Chris that a few weeks ago, the Lord gave me this word and, and, and as I've come over, I really... I was wrestling with God all day yesterday. Lord, I don't think this is the word. And God said, well, I gave it to you. I think I know what, you know. And then, but I was just, God, I don't even know what it is you're really saying. And then last night, I think, I'm not sure what time Chris went to sleep. Um, and, but the whole, most of the night I was up, just going over Habakkuk. And I kind of walked with him last night. I actually cried with Habakkuk last night and felt his pain. Um, so I'm going to try and maybe share what I think God is saying. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm standing with one of those words that's, this is like a, an obedience thing to the Holy Spirit. Do you get me? Yeah. If, if it was up to me, I would preach something else. But, um, <laughs> Habakkuk chapter 2. Verse 1, it says, I will stand my watch and set myself upon a tower, and I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am reproved or corrected. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision. Everyone say, write the vision. It says, make it plain on tables that he may run. Everyone say run. That read of it. Everyone say that reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarry or though it waits, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. It will not wait. I just want to speak, and I'm not going to keep you long. We'll pray. Uh, I want to speak about the writers, readers, and runners. The writers, readers, and runners. Before I kind of get to that, let me just give you a backdrop of this prophet Habakkuk. Everyone say Habakkuk. I'm not sure. Some of you may not have even found that yet. It's like Habahu, Habahu. <laughs> like, but Habakkuk was, is an interesting, is one of them interesting Old Testament, what they call minor prophets. Um, and it, Habakkuk, those books, Habakkuk, Nahum, Amos, they're the kind of books that most Christians don't read. Because it's hard to get an idea of what's going on in some of these books. So they are hard books to actually grasp what is going on in some of these books. Am I right here? Yeah? Most Christians won't tell you this, though. Like, most Christians aren't going to say, you know what, I find those books really boring. But, because I don't get it. But let me just give you an idea of what Habakkuk, who is a prophet, is feeling. If you read chapter 1 of Habakkuk, uh, it starts off by saying, Oh Lord, how long will I cry and you will not hear? 
even cry out to you, violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife, there is contention. The law is powerless, justice never goes forth, and the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. And he goes on. He's complaining. He's saying, God, when I look around, when I look at the nation, when I see what's happening in my nation, it's breaking my heart. And I'm crying out to you, God, and I'm saying, God, would you come back? Would you restore Israel? Would you do something in Israel? And the more I'm talking and I'm asking you, I'm not hearing for you. You feel silent. You feel like you're not doing anything. I'm not hearing anything. I'm not hearing you say, I will restore Israel. I want to hear a word. I think Abacook is saying to God, I want you to tell me, to give me a prophecy that you're going to restore Israel, that you're going to take away the violence, that you're going to take away the oppression. I'm, I'm waiting to hear a word from you, God, that revival's coming to Israel, that you're gonna, there's going to be a breakthrough, that there's going to be a change, and, and families are going to be restored. But God, I'm not hearing anything. He's saying, God, why are you frustrating me like this? Why are you showing me this oppression? And it feels like you're not doing anything about it. Why is it you feel like you're silent? You feel like you're not, it feels like you're not doing anything. And he, he's frustrated. He's complaining out of his frustration. And as I said to you last night, I went over it again. I've been over it the last three weeks, but I went over it again last night. And I kind of wept with him because I got it. I got, I kind of walked with him and, and understood when he's looking around. And I don't know about you, but when I look around the world around me and what's going on in our world. I kind of get what Abacock is saying. I do. I think most people are trying, not you guys, but most people, they, they feel like they're having a great time in this world. But when I look around at the perverseness that's happening in the world, how this world is confusing our young people, particularly now, I mean, it's gone so deep, confusing them about their gender. Confused. I mean, we are actually in a world right now that is trying to just get rid of all gender. Can you imagine that? That's the world we're in, and I'm, I'm living in that world where there's young people confused about who they are, confused about their identity, confused about their sexuality, just confusion. And then, I mean, you guys are safe, but I, I, our church is in the east end of London, uh, we're in the midst of postcode rivalry. So uh, just two weeks ago, there's a mother um, whose uh, son, 14-year-old boy in a playground, was shot dead in his head just two roads away from our church. And right now, just in my congregation, I, I can name at least, I can name at least three mothers, one of them whose son, he's probably 23, 24, and he's been sentenced to 24 years in prison. And I've got these mothers who are watching their sons being incarcerated, uh, just getting involved in violence. And that seems to be the thing that I'm getting calls the most for, the most for, even just before I came here, Someone reached out to me from Cambridge saying they need someone to come into the schools and to teach the young people how to stay away from the gangs and from the violence. And that's the cry that's going on because youth are dying in our nation. Families are breaking up in our nation. There's rife divorces happening in our nation. And on top of that, the cry of Habakkuk is that there's no righteousness. Like, man, God, what's happening? God, what's happening to your church? On top of that, that's what's happening in the world. But what about the church, God? Are you going to move? And so Habakkuk is really, really frustrating. He's really wanting to speak a word. And look at verse 5. This is what God replies him. It says, look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, 
though it were told you. He says, look about you. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do, I am working and I'm doing something and I'm setting so, something up. But the reason why I haven't spoken to you, because what I'm about to do, if I told you what I was about to do, you wouldn't even believe me anyway. Because you're not expecting to hear what you think I'm going to say. So this is what God says to him in verse 6. He says, for indeed, I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and a hasty nation, which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are a terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity precede them from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and more fierce than the evening wolves. Their charges charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as an eagle that hastens to eat. And he goes on, he says, For they come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like sand. They scoff at kings. Princes are scorned by them. Look, now, let me tell you, Habakkuk is saying, God, I'm waiting to hear a word to tell me what you're going to do, how you're going to change Israel and stop the violence and all of this stuff. And God replies to him and says, you ain't seen nothing yet. God says it's actually going to get worse. He says, I'm raising up the Chaldeans. These are the Babylonians. These are like the worst people. God is saying, I am going to bring a, a nation, the Babylonian nation, to come against Israel because of their sins, because of the violence. And these guys ain't messing around. These guys are bad guys. So while Habakkuk is there waiting to hear a word from God, a word of change, because, you know, I don't think it's here, but most churches, they want to hear all nice prophecies. They don't want to hear. No one really wants to be called that. Everyone that's, is a prophetic word, but if the prophetic word was, prepare your house in order, you will die. <laughs> so, oh gosh, I wasn't expecting to hear that. Because most people are like, I don't know, in England, if, if a prophet comes through, they want to hear, God's going to bless you, God's going to give you this, God's going to increase you, great things will happen to your life. No one really wants to hear, I am not pleased with you. <laughs> so God tells answers and replies to Habakkuk, a reply that he wasn't expecting to hear. He wasn't wanting to hear it's going to get worse. He's wanting to hear it's going to get better. God is saying, listen, it's going to get worse. You're going to be, actually, you're going to get carried away out of your land. You're going to be taken into a foreign land by a wicked people, a terrible people. You know the whole story of the Babylonian captivity. God is telling Habakkuk, that's what's going to go down, guy. I'm going to use these guys. And so the story kind of changed when Habakkuk hears that because now Habakkuk is really confused because God, Habakkuk is like, well, I mean, Israel's sin is evil in the land of Israel, but these guys are worse than us. So then why would you use an evil people to dispossess us? We're good compared to them. And like, man, now, if he was confused before, he's totally confused now. God, why would you use the Chaldeans? Why would you use an evil people to do this? Why would you send them against us? And, and that's his dialogue. And God is, is, is having to say to him, listen, I, I've got a plan. I've got a plan. I, I need to squeeze my people. I need to put them in a place where they're going to cry out to me. I need to put them in a place where they're going to want to acknowledge me. You see, when we get at ease in Zion, then we forget God. And they're at ease. He says, I need to put some squeeze on them. I need, I need for them to seek after me. He says, I, I am going to, listen, I'm going to bring them out. If I tell you what I am going to do, you won't even believe me. Say, when I bring them into Babylon, I am going to use one of their kings, Cyrus, who is one of their kings, and God calls him anointed. He says, I'm going to anoint Cyrus. He's going to build. He's going to actually be the one that brings out and builds back the temple. If I tell you that, you ain't even going to believe what I'm going to do. Do you get what I'm saying here, guys? God's saying, I couldn't, the reason why I've been silent with you, because what I'm about to do, you don't want to even hear. And you wouldn't even believe me if I told you. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I feel like God is up to something. I, I actually, I don't want to be negative, but I don't feel like the world around us is going to get any better. I think we need to brace ourselves. Actually, the world around us is going to get worse. But as the world gets worse around us, I'm believing that there are people out there, they're beginning to realize the rottenness of the world. And it will be the greatest opportunity for them to come into a kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy. So if, if, if a people should be preparing themselves, it's the church. While the world is confused, we don't need to be confused. While they are disunified, we don't need to be disunified. While there's wickedness and hatred and, and immorality in the world, we need to have a holiness and a purity. Amen. Because when they leave that world that's dying, they're going to come into a healthy, brilliant, glorious, wonderful, awesome, praying, loving church. And I'm glad I'm a part of the church of Jesus. Jesus Christ. Come on, clap your hands if you're glad. Yeah, I really do. I don't think it's going to get any better out there. So in here, we, we are not going to be confused about our identity. We're not going to be confused about what we believe about our sexual identity. We're not going to be confused about what we believe the Bible says. Amen. I said amen. Amen. That, and I just feel like the voice of the church should be unified on some stuff. While they are disunified, we cannot allow them to change what we believe. And I'm saying to our people, we, we can't be, we can't be intimidated by this world. We can't be intimidated by this world. We can't afford to allow this world to dim us down and to put out our light and to quieten us down. We can't allow this world to put us in the closet when everyone else is coming out of their closet. It's time for us to let our light shine. It's time for us to put our candle on a lampstand and to shine in front of the whole world. Hallelujah. Seriously. Seriously, if there was a time for us and any time for us to be preaching hard the gospel and witnessing to everything that moves, it's a time like now. If there's a time for us to go to our workplaces and to profess and live it and be a Christian and be happy and proud to be a Christian, it's a time like now. I know they seem to be making rules for some and it feels like, and I just I feel it's going that way. They're making allowances for everyone else, but they're trying to dumb us down. They're trying to censor us. They're trying to stop what we preach. They're trying to stop what we believe. They're trying to stop us living this life. And yeah, let's just say it. We, we probably are going to face huge persecution. It's gone quiet. <laughs> uh, yeah. And we will probably face huge, tr huge tribulation. But look, if we want to be, and we, we keep saying it, we, we want the original, we want to be like the early church. Well, if we want to be like the early church, they face tribulation. <laughs> they face persecution. But in the face of persecution, they said, if it's right, or wrong for us to preach the gospel, we must preach what we have seen or heard. If Even if they put us in prison, even if they kill us, amen, we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony, and that we love not our lives, even to the death. So I'm like that, like, I came to Christ, there were things I was willing to die for on the street. I was part of a gang, I was part of a posse, and Ricky's here, we were opposites, we were enemies. He was from Hackney, I was from Bow. We were enemies, we could have been mad enemies on the street, just that we had one mutual friend, Michael. But we were separated, he was in Hackney, I was in Bow, we were separated by a park. And the only time we came together was when the fairground came to that park. And when the fair going came to the park, Bo would go to the fair, Hackney would come to the fair, and it would always kick off. 
I mean, when I say kick off, fights. And of course, our mutual friend Michael, I think you've heard my story, got murdered by guys from Hackney. That even though Michael, uh, Ricky was Michael's friend and I was Michael's friend, he didn't even feel comfortable to come to the funeral of Michael because of the tension between the areas. I'm thinking, you know what? When I was in the world, I, I was prepared to die for foolishness. My guys all around me, we would, we, would, we would stand our ground and we would die for absolutely nothing. So now that I'm in the kingdom of God, now that I'm in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, now I'm a part of the army of the living God. Because now God is for us. Then who can be against us? Now that I'm in the church, do you think we're going to be paralyzed by fear? Because guess what? God has not given us the spirit of fear, but love power and a sound mind. And we are well able. I feel like I'm Caleb and Joshua. While everyone is saying, they are, they, they, we are like grasshoppers. I am not no grasshopper. I don't have a grasshopper complex. Amen. You know what? Caleb, Joshua said, they are bread for us. They are bread for us. We are well able to overcome them. Amen. They may look like giants, but guess what? The God that we serve is greater than anything that comes against us. You should be so blessed and so bold. Be bold. Be strong. I don't, uh, I think, I think, I think, I don't know, I think in England, the church is moving towards trying to do social works and good works, and it's almost like it's trying to change the world and get a part of the world, and, and it's like it's going to make the world a better place. And I don't really think that's our mission. I think our mission is to get people out of it. <laughs> I think it says that we need to pull them out of the fire, right? Hating even the spider. We need to, we are to be rescuing the dying. We are to pull them out of the world into the kingdom of the living God. So Habakkuk is, is feeling, I, I felt his pain. I, I do. I say to my wife all the time, I don't like this world I'm in. I say, I say, I say, Karis, the only thing that, the reason why I'm here is two things. I said, you guys, you and my children and God and his church. If it weren't for the call of God and to preach to this world and you guys, I haven't got nothing more here for. I'm not trying to enjoy this world because of what I see in it. So I feel the pain of Habakkuk. But I want you to see what he says in chapter 2. Chapter 2, he says, I'm going to stand on my watch. He says, I'm going to set myself upon a tower, and I'm going to watch and see what he will say to me. He's saying, you know what? I want to I wanna hear from God. I want to see what God is going to say to me. But in order for me to see what God's going to say to me, I need to go to higher ground. So he says, I need to go up into the tower. Everyone say, into the tower. You see, if, if you want to hear what God is saying, you can't be running around with the chickens. You're going to have to fly like an eagle. He's saying, I need to go up into the tower. I need to go to a higher place. I need to go to a loftier place. I need to see what God sees. I need to be able to see like God sees and hear what God is hearing. That's what Jesus did when he went up into the mountain and looked over. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. See, he was having a different periphery view. If you only knew, if you knew what God wanted to do, how he wanted to hover over you, but you would not. You can't see what I see. If you could see what I see, if you could see what God says. And I really feel like this conference is God saying, listen, I need you to come up to a higher place and I need you to hear 
I think it was with John uh, in Revelation. He says, come up higher and let me show you and tell you some stuff. When God wants to speak to you, he's going to bring you up higher. When he wants to speak to Moses, he says, come up on the mount. Let me talk to you. Amen. Jesus went up onto the mount early hours of the morning. We're going to have to learn to go to a high place to listen what God is saying. And Habakkuk says, God, I'm ready to hear what you're saying. Is everyone here ready to hear what God is saying? So look at verse 2, and I'm going to be out your way in a minute. And the Lord answers, in fact, let me just read the end of verse 1. He says, and what I will answer when I'm corrected. And I'm sure we do that. He's saying, you know, I've premeditated my answer to God when he reproves me. I'm thinking about how I'm going to excuse myself when he reproves me. I'm planning it's like what we used to do with our mom and our dad. When we know we're going to get in trouble, you plan what you're going to say before they tell you off. Habakkuk's doing that here. He says, I want to hear what God's got to say, but when he reproves me, I want to have an answer ready. <laughs> so look at, verse, look, at, uh, look at verse 2. Then the Lord answered and said unto me, Write the vision and make it plain. Upon tablets. Now, I'm not too sure exactly what the vision is that he's supposed to write, but he says, write the vision. I just want to say a few things. Writers, readers, runners. I was, I was wondering, what, God, what, what is this? This is the three words he gave me about two and a half weeks ago. Writers, readers, runners. And it was like this morning when I looked around me and I realized everyone was writing. And that's when it clocked. That's when I got it. That actually over the last, last night and today, you've heard some stuff and most of you have written down some stuff. And you've been writing the vision. You've been writing the vision of intimacy with the Holy Spirit. You've been writing about getting deeper in the Holy Spirit. You've been writing about the love languages of the Holy Spirit. You've been writing about how to connect and get into a prophetic flow of worship. You've been writing what God is saying. God is saying, I want you to write the vision and make it very plain. I want you, I want you to pay attention. And let me just skip Sana. I, I want I want to encourage you. Some of you guys, if you're fresh and you're new, and this is something I, I'd learned to do when I just got saved and I haven't stopped doing it, it's been 30 years, that when I come to church, when I come to fellowship, when I'm, I, I have a pen, I have a paper, and I want to be writing down what I'm hearing being preached. Can I encourage you, amen, that when God is speaking, when God speaks prophetically, when God is teaching you, don't just sit there. Take notes. Write down. I, can't, I, I have a box, a few boxes of all of my books for 30 years. I've got things that God spoke 28 years ago, 29 years ago. And it's interesting when you go back and read over these stuff that you wrote down. Take notes. Touch your neighbor and say, take notes. I'm getting a practical. You know, a guy came to our church a few weeks ago. He came from the States. He's a preacher. And he, it was a midweek service. And he, he, I don't know what he had planned to preach. But when he started, he realized all of my people took out their notepads and they took out their pens. This is what he told me after. He says, when they took out their notepads and their pens, he said, I realize I better have something to say. <laughs> That's what he said. He said, I realized that your people were there to hear something and then they were prepared to write down something. So I couldn't just come and speak any old thing. I had to have something to say. And I don't know if he changed his message there on the spot, but he had something to say. Everyone say, right. Record. That's what the Bible is, isn't it? It's a record. It's a record in the chronicles. Is people chronicling what God has done, what God was doing. The scribes, they scribed what God was doing. And God wants us to scribe. He says he's made our tongue the pen of a ready writer. God wants us to write the vision. He wants us to make it plain. What is God saying? And have you written it? And whatever you have written, whatever you've written over these, the last day and a bit, and the evening, the next thing he says, 
that he may run that reads it. So the first, second thing we need to do is learn to read. There's no point in me writing something that I never go back and read. I was saying to Chris yesterday, a couple of years ago, you know, I decided I'm going to start using my iPad to take notes. So I'll take my, start, instead of my books, I would take my notes on, on the iPad. But I found that I would take notes on the iPad, but I would never go back into the iPad and read over notes. But when I wrote them down, I would go back home and go over my notes. And then I would rewrite it when I did it physically with my hands, but on the iPad. It's, it's almost like before I used to take pictures. I used to like taking pictures with the XLR cameras. Uh, and, you know, you used to take out the film. Do you remember that? Remember the young people say no? You'd take out the film, you'd go to the chemist, and you'd get it processed, and then you'd get your pictures and you'd look through them. Now you can just take all these snaps with your phone, and you probably don't even look through. So I, did, I said to Chris, I've gone back to my pen and paper. Because I found when I go home now, I am actually reading back over what I've heard. And then I will read back over it and rewrite it. And then it becomes plainer and clearer. This is what God is saying to me. I need to write that prophecy that I heard. I need to write down what God has said there. Amen? Because it'd be interesting to go back over that in a year's time, in a year and a half. Man, this is exactly what the Lord said, right? Everyone say, read. I want to encourage you guys to read. Read the Word of God. Read books. Be inspired in your reading. Read over what you have, uh, um, have written, the notes that you have taken. And the last thing the Bible says, that they may run that readers in. I believe that Living Hope has a vision. And I believe that the vision is very, very, very clear to you guys. I was saying to these guys this afternoon, Ricky and Mike, one of the things I, I am so inspired by when I come here is to watch Jonathan lead. I, he's just always leading. There's always intentionality and purpose to everything. And so for me, you really inspire me just how you lead. I, and I'm like a little kid. I want to lead like that. <laughs> I do. I, I do. I, I want to lead like that. Because I think the clearer you make the vision, the Bible says, then those that read it can run with it. Amen. And so when, when the vision's going forth, what was the vision? The vision is that next year at the conference, that the whole of Living Hope is here. Now you can hear that and go away and just walk. But I think it was clear enough that the Bible says that he that reads it will do what? Run. So I, I think what God is saying is that when you've got the vision that's clear, when you know the Great Commission and it's clear to you, it's time to pick up your feet and it's time to run with it. Let me just give you three, three things quickly. Ten minutes and I'm out of your way. All right? Yeah? First, uh, first one I want to look at is in John chapter 20, verses 1 to 9. John chapter... 20 verse 1 to 9. John 21 to 9. Am I doing all right? I was so worried I wasn't going to be all right. It says, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark. And she saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Verse 2. Then she, then she, Oh, oh wow, Jesus has disappeared from the tomb. Oh, I think I better go back and tell the guys. <laughs> she did what? Can you imagine this Jewish girl? I don't know what she was wearing, some long thing, but she probably picked up that thing. <laughs> and she took off running. And she came to Simon Peter and the other disciple, which is John, the one that Jesus loved. And it's always John that says this about himself. <laughs> I don't see that in Mark, and I don't see it in Matthew, and I don't see it in Luke. It's only John that says the disciple that Jesus loved. 
But I understand it because I tell my church that I'm God's favorite child. They, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Look at verse 3. Peter therefore went out and the other di disciple that were, and were going to the tomb. So they both what? Ran together. And the other disciple, where are we? They both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter. Now, this it wouldn't have happened to me. Because I'm like Usain Bolt, you know? The other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he stooping down and looked in and saw the linen cloth lying there, and he did not go in. Now, this is the spirit of Peter. Then Simon Peter came, following him, <laughs> and went into the tomb and saw the linen cloth lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded together in a place by itself. And the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and when he saw it, he believed. So when, when Mary saw that Jesus was gone from the tomb, she ran to Peter and John. And when John and Peter heard this news, they didn't walk to the tomb, they ran to the tomb. They ran so fast that John outran Peter and got there first and looked in. And it shows the, cautious, the cautious nature of John. He came to the entrance of the tomb, looked in, saw the, the linen cloth. But look at Peter, and I love this about Peter. Peter's, when you read him in the Gospels, he's so impulsive. Peter comes. He might have been slower than John. He might have been lagging behind John, but when he comes, he doesn't stop and say, oh, what's going on, John? Peter's like, move out of the way, guy. What are, you, what are you stopping for? And he runs right in. I feel like we need some Peters. There are, you know, people stop short. They stop on the outside of seeing the miracle, and they're looking in, and, they're, and, and you, can, you can be in church and be looking in, seeing people receiving the, the anointing of the Holy Ghost, and you're outside looking in. But what you need to be is like a Peter that's going to run straight in, and you're not going to, you know, like, I thought about this last night when I was preaching. I remember when I was growing up, we used to go to the outdoor Lido. It was an outdoor swimming pool, and we used to go there in the summer. And the water was pretty cold. But when my friends would get there, you know, they would just run and jump in. But I don't like cold water. So I'd be like, how, how does it feel? And they'd be like, it's all right, it's all right. I'm still like this, actually. And they'd be like, once you get in, you'll be all right. I say, yeah, I know that, but it's, once, it's getting in. And I'm always like, if I go swimming now, I'm always testing the water. And I always hear a niggling voice in my head. And I've been hearing this from you. Don't stop and don't ask about Just run and jump in. Is there someone this weekend, this today, that God is saying to you, just run and jump in? And so Peter just runs straight in, and he saw something from the inside that John didn't see from the outside. All John saw on the outside was the linen cloth lying. But when Peter went in, he saw the handkerchief folded. And this is what the Jews would do when they finish a meal. They would fold the handkerchief and put it to one side and say, it's finished. So when Peter saw this, he knew, one minute, this is a word from Jesus. Can you imagine that? Jesus had time when he rose from the dead. I mean, he's gone from the tomb and he's folded up neatly. <laughs> the linen cloth, put it that side. And then he's took the handkerchief that they've put over his face. And he says, you know, let me just fold this up and put this over on the side. Because when they come in, I want them to know that I've finished my meal. I've eaten up death. I've destroyed death. It's finished. So that's, what, that's why the Bible says when John came in and he saw it, he believed. He saw. He knew. Amen. We need some runners in the kingdom. Amen. We need some runners with the vision. 
We need people to run with the vision, run with the vision of the Great Commission, run with the vision of what God is saying here. And what Jonathan got up and spoke just now, he's wanting you to get up and run with it. Just run with it. One of my favorite passages, and I'm going to move on to the next point, the scripture. One of my favorite passages is, is David when he's, at the, um, when he's in the cave of Adullam and he's, he's like, man, you know, there's a siege, Bethlehem. He says, man, I just wish I could get just a drink from some of the water that's at the wells in Bethlehem. And I'm not even sure if he said it out loud, but it was just a little desire. Everyone say a little desire. I don't know if he verbalized. I don't think he was turning to the guys. Guys, you know what? I need you to go and risk your lives. Like, I think he just like, man, I wish I could get some of that war just off the cuff. And then the Bible says that the guys around him heard his desire. And they said, if David wants water, we'll get water. And they got up and ran out of that cave. And they ran into Bethlehem. They ran through the troop of the Philistines. They drew water and they brought it back to David. They risked their lives. I, I just, why I love that passage, because it, it reminds me of when I just got saved. And as a pastor, I wish I had the, I, there are guys that are like that. There are, let me, there are guys. But when I just got saved, my pastor, I, I just wanted to hear a little bit of a desire. If he just Showed a little desire to reach a certain area. Man, I'm like, I'm going to make that happen. I'm going to do that. If he talked about having an outreach in a certain area, I'm on it straight away. I'll, like, when is it going to happen? What do you need done, doing? Do you need people out there? Do you need a, a, a crew to go in? Do you need people? Just a little desire. God needs some runners. Touch your neighbor and say, God needs runners. He, he needs some Hussein Bolts. He needs some Mo Farahs. He needs long-distance runners, and he needs some sprinters, guys. Amen. He needs some endurance runners. I'm not one of them. Chris and, and Carol, the endurance <laughs> runners. It's funny, when Chris was showing that thing in, was it Iceland? I'm thinking, Why? <laughs> I didn't get it. I still don't get it. <laughs> I am telling you, sorry, sorry, I'm going to be funny, but funny. On those kind of expeditions, you will never find a black man. Look at your neighbor and say, run with the vision. Two more passages. 1 Kings chapter 18, 41. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 41. Well done, though, Chris. Oh. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 41. He says, then Elijah said to Ahab, go up and eat and drink, for there is a sound of the abundance of rain. And this is when Elijah had prayed between his, with his head between his legs and told his servant to go and look. And when his servant had looked and three times had gone and come back, he says, I see the cloud of a man's hand. That's when Elijah sent message to Ahab and says, go and eat and drink, because I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. Then he bowed himself to the ground and put his face between his knees. There we go. And he said to his servant, go now and look towards the sea. So he went and looked, and there was nothing. Everyone say there was nothing. Seven times he says, go again. He kept on praying. He kept on seeking. He didn't give up. Then it came to pass the seventh time. Everyone say the seventh time. See, we often give up before we get to the seventh time. That he said, there is a cloud 
as small as a man's hand, rising out of the sea. So he said, go down before, go up and say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Get out of there before the rain stops you. Now it happened that in the meantime, that the sky became black with clouds and wind. And there was a heavy rain. And Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. Can you imagine he's galloping with these chariots? And I just find this fascinating, verse 46. Then the hand of the Lord, everyone say the hand of the Lord. The hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and he girded up his loins, pulled up his, his garments, and he ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. When the Spirit of God came upon Elijah, he outran a horse, a chariot of horses. I'm telling you, when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon us, there's a whole lot of things that we can outrun. That it doesn't matter how fast it feels like the world's getting easy when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon the church. And when we allow the Spirit of God to rest upon us and the hand of God to come upon us, we can outrun what's going on around us. Man, I love the fact that Elijah, you know, he wasn't just a prophetic guy. He became Hussein Bolt. This guy run, outruns a whole fleet of chariots and gets there. I mean, I could just see Elijah standing at the gate when Ahab finally gets there. He says, what took you so long? <laughs> Ahab's like, how did you get here? He uh, ran all the way here. He ran by the Spirit of God. And just quickly, one more thing. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Last passage. Acts chapter 8. Verse 26 to 31. It says, And an angel, this is, Philip had revived in Samaria. And, uh, Seen sorcerers get saved, see um, people burning their curious arts, people being baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. And in verse 26, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip and saying, Arise and go towards the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. There is, this is desert. So he arose and went. And it's interesting that it was one man that God took Philip away from a whole city revival to go and preach to one man. And I wonder how many people could walk away from a whole city revival just to go and preach to one. But watch this. He says, I want you to go and go into the desert. So he rose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship. He was returning, sitting on his chariot, and he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit of the Lord said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading. And he heard him reading the book of Isaiah. And he says, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I accept some man should guide me? And then Philip began to explain to him who he was reading about. And right there, Philip said, the, the eunuch said to Philip, see, here's water, what hinders me. And he baptizes him right there in the desert. And when I read this, I think about Philip. He outran the chariot. He ran to the union. And I think about how many opportunities to minister to someone I miss because I take my time. How many times? I mean, there have been times, don't get me wrong, there's times when God has said, and I've moved. But there's often times when I'm stalling. I'm on a train and I feel the Holy Ghost is telling me to minister to someone. And I'm stalling to do so. I often use the example, you know, you're in a lift with someone and you feel the Holy Spirit saying, or an elevator, you're in the Holy Spirit saying, share the gospel with them. You say, oh Lord. God, if they come off the same floor as me, I'll do. 
Or if you're on a bus. God, if they get off the same bus stop. So then they get off the same bus stop of you. And like, like, there you go. They get off the same bus. But Lord, if they go up there and turn left, then. And we often stall, don't we? God wants us to minister to someone, to share the gospel with someone. But we, we whether it's through fear or intimidation, we, we don't do it. And we miss Wonderful opportunities. I think I was sharing last year when I was here. We was on the train during um, the Gay Pride um, week in um, London. And one of our girls had a, a birthday party in the middle of it, but didn't realize it was during that time. We get on the train and there's all riding this on the train. And there's a young girl. And I said, to, I said to one of our girls, I said, I think God wants you to go and witness to that girl. And invited the church. And she's like, what are you joking? I said, no, no, I think God wants you to go and witness to that girl. And she's like, I said, seriously, um, go and... And she just wouldn't do it. She wouldn't, she just felt, I don't know if embarrassed, etc. So anyway, my daughter was with us, my, my physical flesh daughter, and she went over and began to speak to the girl and got a conversation and... Uh, invited the church and I got a card gave to this young lady and then the girl got off the train that was Saturday night the Sunday morning we get to church who do you think was the first one in church this young lady the girl that I told to go and do it that didn't do it she was shocked she was embarrassed <laughs> and the girl came to church gave her heart to the Lord and has gone back to Australia. We could have missed an opportunity right there, right? And I, I think God wanted that girl to have the experience, to break the fears, whatever fears we have. God is saying, we need to be like Philip. We need to run to the people that God is directing us to. And if God, if wherever you are, at work, on the road, on the street, wherever you are, on the bus, on the train, wherever you are, uh, in the supermarket, if God prompts your heart to share and to minister to someone, don't hesitate. Run. Everyone shout, run. If God tells you to do something, God is wanting you to pick up your feet and to run with it. And I just feel like, as I close, I feel like the church is just like a slow, not, not you guys, you guys are good. I mean, every time I come, you're improving. And, and I'm not saying this to flatter you, honestly. I mean this. You're always improving. Something's happening. But most churches, 90 something church, it's slow. They're still doing what they were doing 30, 40, 50 years. Nothing changes. Do you get what I'm saying? And it's like a slow. And God must be frustrated. Come on, pick up your feet and begin to run. God wants a running church. He wants running believers. He wants running preachers. He wants running soul winners. He wants running intercessors. He wants running prophets. He wants a running church. He wants a church on the move. Come on, stand with me right now. So I really feel like God is saying... He said to Habakkuk, Habakkuk, I want you to write the vision. I want you to make it plain that those that read it would run with it. I feel the whole thing that God is saying. What we've heard, what we've heard over today, what we've heard last night and today, God is saying, don't take your time. Guarantee if you take your time, you are going to forget what you've heard. Wherever God has spoken to you, he's saying, run out and start doing it straight away. If God has touched your heart to wake up earlier and begin to pray, run out and do it tomorrow morning. If God has touched your heart and, and he's told you, you need to evangelize more, you need to witness more, you need to love me more, you need to, you need to break out of your comfort zone and you need to express yourself a little bit more in your worship. You need to sing a new song. Don't wait till two weeks' time. Do it now. Run out of this conference and say, God, what you've told me to do, I'm going to run into it. I'm going to run into the purposes of God. I'm going to run into the promises of God. I'm going to run into the will of God. I'm going to run into the things of God. I'm not going to take my time. I'm not going to crawl. I'm not going to walk slowly. I'm not going to stroll. I am going to run. 
If you're here today and you just feel like as we close out this conference, you want to just run. You know, if you're here and you've been, you've been in a, a comfortable place, you, you're not, you've not yet committed, you've been hanging around, you've been looking in and you've been seeing, and you've been feeling like God is tugging you and telling you to come. Today, don't hesitate any longer. Let's just run. Why don't you just run to this altar right now and run to this front right now and say, God, you know, I've been hesitating for a long time. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm going to run, Lord. You've been in a, a, a comfort zone. You've been holding back. So, and, and you felt the Holy Spirit telling you, over today, it's time, it's time, I want you, I want you, I want you closer, I want you deeper, I want you more intimate, I want you more worshipping, I want you more expressive, I want you to give your all. Today, no more hesitation, no more strolling, now I'm picking up my feet, I'm going to do like Elijah, I'm going to pull up my loincloth and I'm going to run. I'm going to be like the eunuch, I'm going to be like Peter, I'm going to be like John, I'm going to be like Mary and I'm going to run to the things of God. elders, pastors, there's things that God has been speaking to you about doing, little changes, tweaks to do in your congregation, and you've been putting it off and putting it off and waiting for a convenient season, and God's a little bit grieved, as Chris was talking about God, Holy Spirit being grieved, he's been grieved, I understand, I know it, we've been taking our time to do some of the things that Holy Spirit has been saying, and you know once you do these things, it's going to bring a change, God is saying it's time to run now and just do these things that God's been saying, and watch what God will do. I just wonder if we can just reach out right now and say, God, I'm going to, I've written the vision, God, and I've seen it clearly. I'm going to write the vision. I'm, I'm reading, God, and I'm going to pick up my feet, and I'm going to be a runner. I'm going to run fast, God. I'm going to run hard, Lord. I'm going to run a good race, Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs>